Hello and welcome to the Leathercraft Masterclass with March's Q&A. March's? March. March Q&A, that's the one. <laughs> I have six, yes, six good hot off the press questions straight from Instagram stories. And if you're not following me on Instagram, don't forget, at Leathercraft Masterclass, where if you want to see extra content not seen on YouTube, don't forget to follow me there as well. So I have six new questions that I've gathered, all from followers. So if you want to get your questions in, either comment below, so you can put your questions in below this on YouTube, or you can go to Instagram and put it in my stories when requested every month. And don't forget, if you want your free Leathercraft and tool guide, don't forget to hit the link below leathercraftmasterclass.com and I'll send it straight to your inbox. And for this month, we have a brand new course and this course is teaching you how to make a jewelry case. So this is a very traditional technique or techniques involved in this in creating your very own jewelry case and also an accessories pouch that goes with it. Now this is a travel jewelry case, but the techniques learned inside this course can be used on much larger cases should you wish to do so. Now this is using exotic leathers, obviously, as you can see, but you can use any kind of leather that you want. You can use chrome tan, you can use vegetable tan, use cowhide, calf, goat, whatever you want to use on this. I'd recommend goat personally, great value, great grain, and really easy to work with for something like this. So as usual, I'm going to go live on Instagram. We're gonna take some live questions as well as I'm answering these. So six questions, yes, but there's usually a little bit more as well. So let's hit live and we'll take it from there. All right, we're live. We're telling your followers that you've started a live video. That's always a good start. Right, so let's start with question number one. Uh, and this is a question I get a lot. I get it asked a lot on the Masterclass forum as well. Um, I get it asked in DMs, I get it asked by email. One of the biggest issues with doing custom leather work um, is hot foiling, okay? Or even just stamping your own logo into your leather work. Because a lot of people wanna do it, especially when they first start in leather craft. They wanna go, they go, okay, I've, I've made this wallet. I love the way it looks, I'm really proud of it. I'd love to put my stamp on it, my seal of approval. I wanna put my name on it. Um, and that's what a lot of people wanna do when they start improving their work and it's completely understandable. So they go uh, online and they put in hot foil machine, hot stamping machine, and the prices that come up are probably a zero or two more than they bargained for. So a hot foil machine can set you back several thousand pounds for a very good one or several thousand dollars uh, for a really good one. So people start looking towards places like eBay, Amazon, AliExpress, Taobao, um, and a few others where they can purchase a much cheaper machine, usually a Chinese made machine. Uh, and that was what this person is asking me here. What do you think of inexpensive hot foil machines on Amazon around 160 euros. So obviously they've gone onto Amazon and they've seen the prices of them and there's probably one that's 160 euros. The cheaper, smaller units from China are usually around 100, 200, 300 mark. What do I think of them? I've only had, well, I've only had two experiences with them. I've had two experiences with them. Uh, this was a few years ago, mind you, and I've noticed that China usually starts putting out really low quality stuff, and then as market demand increases, there's companies in China that start kind of catching up and producing better stuff. Pricking irons used to be terrible from China. They used to be all really bad stitching chisels, and they still produce those, but over time, some of the best quality stuff is now coming from China with regards to leather craft tools. Really strange, I don't know why. But that might be happening with hot foil machines, I don't know. But my experiences are pretty negative. The first machine that I got, uh, I can't remember where I got it, but I bought it online and it was around 200 pounds. And I remember after about, must have been a few days of using the first unit, I was pulling down and I was pressing into some vegetable tan leather to get a nice kind of deep logo in there. And I remember, just feeling the, the lever, the ram, just give all of a sudden. I was thinking, that's strange, and then it stopped. And then put it back up, open up the machine, and what's inside is a rack and pinion, okay? So you have your, I believe it's the pinion is the circle, like a, a cog with teeth, 
and then you have a rack which is teeth but they're straight and as the cog rotates as you pull the ram down it goes up and down like so. Now the, the cog itself, the pinion, was made of solid steel as it should be and the rack, the teeth, was made from aluminium okay, or aluminium if you're from the States. And the last tooth takes all the pressure at that point where you're pressing it into the leather. And of course, it just snaps. So I contacted the company. I said, look, this is what's happened. I gave them photos, etc. Uh, and they were nice enough to send a brand new unit to me, free delivery, everything sorted out. That one lasted a bit longer, about two to three weeks, probably because I was doing it a little bit more gingerly. I was being a bit conservative with the pressure and I was avoiding using it for anything that uh, required, you know, pressing it firmly into veg tan leather. Uh, but the same thing happened and I had to try, to try and move the rack down to get nut, and then it happened again and it was just absolutely useless. So in the end, I contacted uh, a company in Colchester called Metallic Elephant. You may have heard of them. Uh, about an hour, hour and 30 minute drive from me. So I went up there and they took me into the showroom and allowed me to kind of play with various models. <clears throat> the one that I ended up purchasing was actually uh, one of, I think it is their cheapest model actually. It was about 1,500, so 1,500 pounds. Gonna be around $2,000, uh, not including type obviously. That's about 500 pounds. And uh, I remember trying out various ones and having a look at them all. And the one that I wanted was just a small unit because I was in a much smaller workshop there as well and it's portable. Uh, so I went with that one and the, the difference is night and day. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, there are a lot of different brands, um, but things like Metallic Elephant, Howard, Kingsley, um, Quick Print, you know, there's a few decent brands. Sometimes you'll have to get them secondhand. Sometimes they're vintage models and the parts are no longer made, so you have to watch out for that. But if you can buy from a reputable brand, uh, it's worth its weight in gold. And I will say one thing, if you go for a really good quality hot foil machine, it tends to hold its value much better than a cheaper Chinese made unit. It's very tempting to go that route. But right now I haven't seen anything um, that tells me that they're producing anything really good. There's companies like Dream Factory where they, they produce one that's, um, what is it now? It's, it's a hot foil machine, but it's also a clicker press as well. So it kind of like does two jobs in one. I think that's around a similar price. Haven't used it, they've offered it to me, but I have one already. Um, but uh, that looks pretty nice. I mean, I'm sure there's gonna be cheaper brands coming along that are still suitable, but even if you end up, end up not using it uh, and you wanna sell it, you're gonna get a lot of what you paid for it back because these machines, they're really designed for life and, and hard use and daily use that you would get inside a, a workshop. So there's always a few consumables inside the machine. For example, some of the electronics might need replacing fuses, uh, heating ele elements might last you, you know, a decade, maybe longer if you're lucky. But there's a few things that need to be replaced, but generally the machine as a whole, cast iron and steel, um, you know, you're gonna get a lifetime out of it, several lifetimes in fact. So I always um, say, uh, and I get this from, uh, <laughs> an advert, Stella Artois, Stella Artois advert, uh, reassuringly expensive, okay? So there are some things, especially machinery, you wanna pay a high price for, as long as you can justify it. Uh, there was an advert years ago for Stella Artois, and it was always some kind of comical scene of somebody going through hell and high water to get to the bar to get a pint of Stella Artois. And it was always usually like a, from a hundred years ago, a farmer going, doing something comical. But at the end of it, it would always say, as he's drinking it and just like, oh my God, this tastes so good. It would always say reassuringly expensive because they were priced as a premium beer. It's not good beer, but they're priced as a premium beer. And uh, yeah, I always think of that reassuringly expensive because when you buy something that is a higher value machine, whether it's Skyver machine, hot four machine, or whatever, um, there's a little bit of um, security in having something that's just built better and built well. So what do I think of uh, inexpensive hot foil machines on Amazon for around 160 euros? About as much as I think of uh, laser eye surgery for 160 euros. <laughs> Not a lot. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, the next question is, what are the key skills and product characteristics for the fine leather crafts style. So I'll read that again. 
what are the key skills and product characteristics for fine leather craft style? So what makes something fine leather craft to more towards the luxury side of things versus other styles um, such as rustic, such as minimalist, uh, and a few other basic styles. So what really sets it apart? Now I'll start off by saying I did a blog post on pretty much this subject. Uh, and you can go onto leathercraftmasterclass.com, click on the blog, and if you scroll right down to the bottom, because uh, it was one of my early uh, blog posts, and there's a few now, uh, you'll see Fine Leathercraft, Seven Signs of Luxury. Uh, I won't go through all seven because I don't really have time. Plus, at the end, there's a bonus with loads of other small, kind of like smaller indicators of luxury. But just the, the first three, the first indicator of, of luxury is edge finishing. It's the quality and the finesse of the edge finishing. Now, edge finishing really does take time. It's something that I teach in my courses, obviously, but it really does require practice. And when you practice, and you've done meaningful practice and you've incrementally improved, it really does show in the quality of your edges. And that could be edge burnishing, that could be edge paint, that could be um, a turned edge, it could be French binding, it could be regular edge binding. Whatever it is, if you can make it so that it's clean looking, there's no lumps or bumps, and it's the finest possible, it's a consistent edge, because consistency is everything in edge finishing, then it really does set your work apart from the rest. That's one of the indicators is always looking at the edges. If ever I'm in a, a luxury store, you know, looking for inspiration from various different high-end brands like Harrods, for example, that some of you know I like to frequent, um, I really like looking at new releases, uh, especially when I can kind of open them up, have a look around, look at the quality of it. One of the first indicators I look for is what are the edges like, okay? The edges are no good, you can tell they've probably paid for another brand to make it at a cheaper price for them. It's usually because it takes time to, to make a really good edge. So edge finishing is the first thing I, I look for. Another one that I really feel kind of sets work apart is small little details in the aesthetics such as raised detailing. So I've written down raised detailing. It's where you have a raised area, it could be on a watch strap, a leather watch strap, on a leather belt, could be detailing on a bag. Um, it's a raised area that just adds more visual interest and a little bit more intrigue to the product. Sometimes it's practical, like the raised area in the center of a belt, you want the edges to be nice and thin for something a bit more refined, but you want that bulk in the center for stiffness when you're putting it through the belt loops, uh, but also for strength and stretch resistance. So it does form in certain products a practical element but it really does add a 3D look to it where the light hits it on one side, but there's a shadow on the other. It just makes it look a little bit more interesting than something that's uh, just you know plain sheet leather, for example. So raised detailing also shows the craftsman has really thought about the design and also has the skill to pull it off at the same time. So raised detailing is another one. The last one that I've got on the list, and remember there's seven in total, but you'll be able to read the rest in the blog is slim edges. It's not easy to get a product with nice slim edges, you know, a really nice wallet. Uh, for example, the Slimline Coat Wallet, which was a course that I produced. A lot of that was really focusing on getting those thin edges, keeping the bulk overall down as well. But just having those thin edges shows that you're good at skiving, shows that you can layer well, and a consistently thin edge as well. So if you're, uh, perhaps new and you're trying to a really thin edge, it can be sometimes inconsistent, thicker in parts and thinner in others. So when you have that really smooth, thin edge, it makes it look more refined and also shows that the craftsman has really worked on it. And remember, anytime that you look at something, you can, you can tell the person that worked on this knows what they're doing. That's really a sign of good craftsmanship and therefore luxury at the same time. So that's just three excellent edge finishing, raised detailing, and the ability to pull off slim edges. So they're three of the seven main signs. So don't forget the rest of it is in the blog, leathercraftmasterclass.com. This one, I, really, <laughs> I like this question. I like this question. I do and I don't, I do and I don't. Okay, here's, here's why. This question is, can leatherworking make me rich? Okay, specifically hand stitching only. Can leatherworking uh, make me rich? 
if I'm hand stitching. First of all, anything can make you rich. People do the strangest things and start the strangest companies and it makes them a huge wad of money. Anything can make you rich. It depends on the person. It's the person that pulls it off. But I will tell you something straight off the bat. If that's your main concern, and I really hope it's not, if your main focus in, in anything is all about getting to the point where you consider yourself rich, your focus is not where it should be, which is uh, essentially a higher purpose, building a brand, building a company that serves its customers better than anybody else, building the best that you can actually be. You know, it's, it's something that's gonna be bigger than just getting to the point where you're con you consider yourself rich. And you're not rich if you're still drinking out of uh, mason jars anyway. <laughs> I don't know why I have that. I think everything else needs washing up. Anyway, <laughs> so can leather working make me rich? Okay, so let's just, let's humor this question uh, and break it down. So a quick cursory look online. It's, I've only got 2017 results, so the numbers are gonna be a little bit skewed. Let's say that you consider rich as in the top 1% in, uh, in, of earners in your country, okay? So in the UK, the top 1% in 2017, it's gonna be higher now, but it was 166,000 pounds per year, okay? Would put you in the 1% bracket. It's probably closer to 200,000 now, but anyway. 166,000, which is $216,000 or 198,000 euros per year, okay? Obviously, that will put you on the 1% range. You're, you're into super tax at that point, so a lot of that is gonna get taken away from you. You'd probably be better off earning that in the United States because you guys cap it at 37%. But anyway, okay, so uh, let's break this down. So let's say that in a year you've got, what, 52 weeks. Let's say that you make a bag every two weeks. So how much would you have to charge? So let's uh, take 166,000. This is funny. Uh, 166,000 divided by or half of 26 equals. So you'd need to sell a bag every two weeks with an average price of 3,000, six, sorry, 6,384 6, pounds. Okay, now obviously there's gonna be products that are way more expensive and way cheaper, but that needs to be your average over that amount of time. Is it possible? Yes. Some people, um, know how to network, some people know how to uh, build a customer base that's very wealthy, word of mouth spreads, they're very good at marketing, they know how to tell a story. Um, people like this do exist in all different industries. You know, I remember seeing some pottery ones that someone created and they were asking over 200,000 pounds for it, for essentially a what looked like a piece of a glass plate to me, it was really strange. I was thinking whoever made that is an absolute genius to convince people to make that amount of money. There are many artists that do it, but remember for every one person that's doing it, there's hundreds or thousands who've tried and not succeeded. So it really does come down to the individual. It comes down to hard work. It comes down to persistence. It comes down to luck is even in there as well. Everything into the mix. The stars have to align to create your unicorn leather craft business. But yes, it is possible. Um, if you consider the 5% of earners in your country, that would mean you would have to earn 75,000 pounds a year or $98,000 or 90,000 euros. So if you consider the 5% rich, then it's gonna be a little bit easier. But is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? No, especially if your main concern is getting rich in the first place. I would uh, probably look elsewhere. I hear cryptocurrency is good, but what do I know? <laughs> okay, so next question, moving on to the third question. I'm gonna mark these off actually. Right, so Lone Wolf here. I don't think that's his name. I think uh, he's indicating that he works for himself. Uh, Lone wo uh, Wolf here. Mastering craftsmanship skills over managing slash marketing or both. So breaking down the question even further, the, it's really asking as a sole trader, for example, what's more important to the success of your business, your craft skills or your skills in business, your skills in marketing and advertising, or is it both? Now, some people will say uh, it's, 
you know, it's 50-50, you know, it's 50, 50, half and half of each. Some people say, oh, it's, you know, it's 80% craft skill and 20% marketing. Some people say it's the complete opposite. When you, when you have your own business, obviously this doesn't make sense, but you've got to think like it does. You need 100% of both, okay? So 200%, that doesn't make sense, but you make it work. That's running your own business, okay? You're, you're juggling everything. You have, to be, you have to be really good at a handful of things, like two, three, or four things, proficient at 10, reasonable at 20, but at, at the top, at the apex, there's certain things that you need to do really well and you need to get right. Um, obviously, your craft skills have to set you apart. Now, that could be your designs, your finishing, uh, the type of leathers that you're working with. Something has to stand out from everybody else. You, you never want to be comparable. As soon as you're comparable, People start going, hmm, which one should I choose between? When you can stand out, even if you don't appeal to everyone, as long as you can stand out above the rest in some way, you can start making sales and you can start doing well. Now that could be standing out in the way you do your marketing. That could be standing out in the way that you communicate with your audience of potential customers. That could be lots of different things, but you always want to stand out uh, and be a little bit different. When it comes to marketing, that's something else that you need to understand. The amount of craftspeople that try and start a leather goods business and they've never read one book on marketing, online sales, running your own business, uh, because it's more of an afterthought. If you consider those things an afterthought, you're really going to struggle unless you get lucky. Some people get lucky, but you really need to Educate yourself on certain subjects that are going to help. If there's one thing that I can kind of finish this, this on is if no one knows you exist, you're not going to make any sales. And that's what marketing is, is letting, at the very least, letting people know that you exist. And here's what I create. Here's how it can benefit you. Here's what you need to do next if you want to be part of this or you want to buy this or you want to have this. It's essential that, that people know you exist in the first place. Otherwise, how are you gonna make sales? Now, there's always examples of where this is completely wrong, where you know, someone gets word of mouth from an influencer or someone who's in a, a certain social circle and everybody else wants that as well, and then now that person has a waiting list of three years. There's always these little, as I mentioned before, these little unicorn businesses where it's a mixture of a lot of things and luck is up there as well, but in general, you need to understand marketing. So do online courses on marketing as well. I mean, I'm a huge proponent of online courses. Why I do this? I did online courses on presenting, on lives. Uh, I've done online courses on uh, videography and editing, online courses on photography, business and marketing. You know, it, it takes knowledge to then make these things work. So. Uh, it's a little bit of everything, unfortunately. It would be nice if you could just make something really nice and the work sells itself. Uh, that's a rare, a rare occurrence. Jose says, you are great. Thank you very much. I'm glad you think I'm great. Right, so I'm gonna cross that one off. Okay, so uh, next question. How do you skive chrome tanned leather when it's soft and stretchy? Now this is, um, this is one of the reasons why I, I recommend that when people first start in leather craft, veg tan is your friend, okay? Because it takes a little bit more skill in general to work with chrome tan leathers. It's a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. It doesn't always do as it's told. It doesn't hold still uh, when it should do. And one of those is skiving as well. So if you have a skiving knife, for those of you who don't know what skiving is, you have a skiving knife and you're trying to thin the edges for whatever reason. Maybe you're doing a turned edge. Um, maybe you're thinning two parts so that the edge isn't too thick on a wallet or a bag, for example. On chrome tan leather, which is quite soft and stretchy, if your blade isn't super, super sharp, then it can start pulling and stretching. And when you start doing that, it's very difficult 
to get the angle consistent. And what tends to happen is you will have some parts on your sky that are deeper than others, uh, some are a little bit higher than others, and you get this inconsistent sky. Uh, another issue is it starts stretching and then the fluff holds on on the front and it just kind of folds over and then you're trying to hack away at it, trying, trying to peel it off. Essentially, it's just very challenging. Two things that I, I noticed that make life easier when you want to try and skive chrome tanned leather. Uh, number one, have a clean paring stone. So it's a very smooth, slick surface. I've always preferred, um, over all else, a very polished surface of granite. Marble is fine, but granite is harder. A nice polished surface really sticks leather onto it. So a good clean surface, clean it regularly, use a scraper if necessary to take off any debris, and then just put some alcohol on a rag and rub it over just to clean your surface. And you'll find leather sticks a lot better to it as well. The second uh, recommendation is going to be make sure you press the leather firmly. So the thing with chrome tan is there's more of a gap between the fibers. So it insulates quite well, which is why you get garment leather, which is chrome tanned as well. Uh, insulates better, but it's very compressible and stretchy. So what I like to do is press the knife down into the edge of the leather. That tends to firm it up as you compress it. And then as you're compressing, you're starting to pull along. So you wanna keep a lot of down pressure whilst you're pulling along slowly. You don't need as much down pressure when you're using vegetable tanned leather. It's stiff, it's firm, it doesn't move around as much. And as long as you can get a good hold on it, it's relatively easy to skive. The third and final recommendation is your knife sharpening skills need to be up there to skive chrome tanned leather. You can try and skive chrome tanned leather and it's not quite sharp enough. And then you put it on vegetable tanned leather and you're actually able to skive it reasonably well. It takes a slightly sharper edge to cut through chrome tan leather well. So that's something to work up on and make sure that your knife sharpening skills are really up there. So clean paring stone, lots of down pressure as you're pulling along and a scary sharp blade are all uh, gonna help you out in doing that. Jose Malura says, I got your course online and they're amazing. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Leathercraft Masterclass. Thank you for saying that. Hi from Greece, mentor. Hey, how's it going, Konstantinos? Okay, so I'm gonna cross that one off the list. That's done. We have a last question. Last question. And it is, what is a good all-round all to start with for a beginner leather crafter? And that's actually another common question is, what's a good all to start with? So many people start the craft and they keep the, the tools quite simple, uh, have a, a decent pricking iron, uh, stitching iron to go all the way through the leather, you know, have your basics of your hammer and needles and thread and things like that. And then they start seeing people using clams and awls and wondering what they're for and they kind of investigate a little bit further and go, yeah, I'd like to try that. I'd like to explore uh, the possibilities of stitching thicker leather or awkward areas or all the different things that awls are good for. So the next question is, which one should I go for? There's a lot of different companies producing them and they're all different sizes or different blade lengths and weird and wonderful different, you know, woods in the handle and things like that. Which one should I really go for? I would I'd recommend that you try, if possible, to go somewhere where you can actually hold an awl. You'll get a very quick idea of what feels good in your hand, what feels too diminutive and too small to control well, or what feels too big and cumbersome in the hand. I prefer awls on the smaller side. I find it easier to manipulate between the fingers. So I would choose something that I probably should go for a medium, but I prefer medium to small, just so it moves around in, in my hand and I can flick it back and forth really quickly. But it's, it's personal taste, but you'll find very quickly. Failing that, you could always, it's not ideal, uh, but if you're paying for return fees, it's not so bad, buying a couple of sizes and then returning the one that doesn't feel quite right to you. So as long as you're not taking advantage of free returns from small companies, uh, I, I would try as much as you can to go somewhere where you can try them out. Or, you know, if you know someone who's a leather crafter who, who has different awls, ask them, can, do you mind if I come around and just try them out? 
there might be someone in your local area who's might be very happy with you doing that so uh, try and try out the all size the half size yourself which is the handle um, okay so the haft is this part here okay so that's the handle itself that you hold on to usually with your dominant hand and um, we have the ferrule here which usually holds the wood together from splitting, not so much in the case of this awl, even though it looks like it, but most awls, it's just a cylinder that stops the wood from splitting. And then at the end, we have the blade. So that's what you push through the leather, and then as you pull it out, you chase with the needles, okay? So what size blade do I recommend? I, a great all-round size, uh, I found is about 25 millimeters long, 20 to 25, okay? It's gonna be good for small to medium size work. For larger stuff, you know, really big handles and trunk handles and box stitching, you know, you can go for something that's uh, obviously much larger. So this is gonna be about 35 millimeters long, 37. So, you know, you can, they can go really large, but as an all-rounder, I think uh, 25 millimeters or an inch for those that use uh, imperial measurements. Uh, and width-wise, something that's around 2.5 millimeters wide. So that's gonna be good for anywhere from, if it's tapered, from, you know, three millimeter to 3.85 in, uh, in iron size. That's gonna be, around yeah so 25 millimeters by 2.5 millimeters so the next question is tapered versus non-tapered really uh, a tapered awl is like that okay so the deeper the awl blade goes in the wider the cut that it makes now there's benefits to that because if you're stitching with thicker thread thicker needles and a thicker project you can push it further in and simulate a larger awl or you can keep it shallow for small things but it does require a little bit of uh of hand-eye coordination for making sure that you don't push it too far in because then you have one large slit next to a smaller one and it can throw off your stitching. So some people put little layers of leather on there to limit how far it can go in. Okay, so you can get a hole punch, a small one, just punch, push it on, punch another one, push that on, and you can then limit how deep you can go. So that's another way of getting around that. A uh, straight-sided awl that has no taper, so it's a sharp front and it's like a, a straight sword, okay? That one is not depth sensitive. You can push it all the way in or shallow and it makes the same cut. Um, it's really up to you which one you choose. I reckon that non-tapered is a little bit more uh, specialist to a particular pricking iron size, but a good all-rounder is a tapered one where you can actually simulate a larger awl so you don't need as many awls. So that is my recommendation. Try out the half size if you can. Always see if you can try something out to see if you like it first and then compare it to another awl and see what works for you. But avoid getting um, an awl blade that's too long because that can be cumbersome and you can accidentally scratch your work very easily. And uh, avoid getting anything that's too small. I've seen some like eight millimeters. And that's a very small specialist work. You wouldn't want to try and make a bag with that. So, okay, just gonna go through just in case I've missed any questions. I think there was one from earlier. What's your favorite knife for cutting leather? Uh, there's a lot uh, that I use in various different circumstances, but the, the knife that I probably use the most is this, the Italian Trincetto knife. Okay, I learned the other day that Trincetto in Italian means knife. So I've been calling it the knife knife. It's the Trincetto knife. <laughs> But this is it. So it's uh, made in Italy. It's just made from a steel, uh, steel tube, uh, brass tube. This is nickel plated, so your hands don't smell. And uh, inside I've put a little blade. I've made it myself from a hacksaw blade, but you can use nine millimeter snap offs like that on the inside of this with no problem. And it does come with a blade that you need to sharpen yourself. Very basic design. A lot of the Italian pattern makers and shoemakers use it. Uh, I tried it, I think it was about 10 euros or even less and absolutely loved it. I love its precision. It's got a very flat part to it there. And when you put it in your hand, you can always make sure that you're upright all the time rather than something that's cylindrical and it could turn in your fingers and you won't notice it. And then you've got an edge like that. Another one that I really like is the, uh, the Stanley 
10-095. So that's the Stanley 10-095. I've actually taken out the little slider in there because I don't think it's needed. But all you have to do is undo the back end and you can pull out your nine millimeter snap off blades, put it back into the depth that you want and then tighten it up. You can even take it out and put your blade in there and snap the end off, absolutely no problems. Uh, it's a really good one if you like the, um, the snap off. Feels great in the hand as well. A little bit more thickness on the top, so a little bit more down pressure if you need it, but it's, they're very, very cheap, and very, very effective. Um, if you're on the market for one, that's a good one. Uh, is there another one? Uh, is this an NT Cutter that I like as well? NT Cutter, another good brand. NT Cutter, Alpha. I have a, a Schum English, George Barnsley Shoemakers. I'll, I'll get it if I'm talking about it. I might as well show you. One second. So there's a clicker knife with a little hook bill blade on the front. Again, I made this from um, a hacksaw blade. This is really, really good for thick leather. And if you need to cut a very tight curve in something, uh, then that little hook blade really makes a difference. This is held differently. It's not held like a regular blade, which is more like a pencil, like that, so you can index your fingers against the, uh, the cutting surface. This is held in the hand like so, and you use your index finger to just to identify that it's upright because there's a straight section, and then you can cut like so. So this is really good for thick, heavy, heavy hides, tight curves, and it serves a purpose. So I like to have a few different ones on hand. Snap-offs with a 30 degree angle are really great for cutting out patterns as well and uh, thin skins because it's about 0.4 millimeters thick, which is very, very thin. Hello from the USA. Purchased your course, courses recently and they are very well made. Thank you, man. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thanks for saying that. It's always good. Uh, sorry, Phil, the video was a bit jittery when you spoke about chrome tan skiving. Uh, how would you keep down pressure on? Okay, apologies for that. Yeah, the internet's a little bit weird. Okay, so um, obviously on a paring stone, but we'll pretend that this is a paring stone. Down pressure is you're using your fingers like so, and as you're, let's not use my hand. I think this is a little bit low for the camera. As you're pushing down, you're really using your fingers there, and you're using your ring finger and your pinky and the side of your thumb to hold the underneath. So you're really, really pushing down with the pressure here as you're skiving along, okay? So you don't want to hold it like that too much. You really want to kind of choke up on the blade and get nice and close so you can pressurize that leather as you're skiving forwards. So that's why I would suggest on that one. And you might need to have your hand off the edge of the paring stone so that you can do that. I use a surgical blade. Yeah, I mean, I do have a Swan Morton surgical knife. I very rarely use it. It's usually for really specialist stuff. I probably couldn't even tell you what I'd use it on. Probably just removing some thickness in a very small area for something like that. But it really does allow you to do some fine detailed work. So yeah, the surgical knives are great. The only thing is they don't, you know, they're, they're really not designed for going through uh, leather, which is mildly abrasive um, onto a cutting surface which holds a lot of grit, which is probably the main reason why your knives wear down as fast as they do. Scissors, what scissors do you use? Uh, vintage scissors, I'll show you. <laughs> so I have a bit of, bit of a collection. I've restored a lot of them. Um, so these are Taylor shears. So I use this uh, for lots of different things. So a lot of the time I use this for material. So if I'm cutting like for the interior of a bag, I'm cutting uh, canvas, cotton canvas. This is really, really good for going through long lengths because a lot of the time you buy it in uh, like meter lengths and you can make some really quick, accurate cuts with this. For patterns, I have this one. This is a uh, dressmaker's scissors. That's about 13 inches. I think this is 12. Yeah, 12. And uh, yeah, so this one's been restored. That one's from 1920. I think this is from 1910, Wilkinson & Co. It was heavily rusted when I got it. But the great thing about the old shears is they've got um, lined blades. So they've got a harder piece of steel on the inside, 
and then softer on the outside for strength, otherwise it would be too brittle. But the modern ones don't have that, even though they make them very similar. Uh, so the old ones are definitely the best. I've had to replace the bolt on this one, I use brass, but yeah. And I've got um, knife edge shears for leather as well. I've got a whole selection up on the wall there. And yeah, I collect scissors as much as I collect hammers as well. There's loads of different hammers that I have. So I do like a tool or two. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I think my connection is dropping on Instagram. Apologies guys, uh, if you've been watching this and it's not been great, I appreciate you sticking around for it, however. Um, so I'm gonna cut the live short now and just say thank you very much for joining me. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here, asking me questions and joining in the conversations. Always good uh, when you guys get into the conversation as well. It just makes it a lot more fun as well. So uh, a little bit more enjoyable. So I hope some of your questions uh, have been answered in this month's Q&A. Don't forget, there's still that offer of the free tool buyers guide and leather selection video if you go to leathercraftmasterclass.com, link in bio for Instagram. Don't forget to go there and grab that as well. And in the meantime, don't forget for a lot of you who have purchased the courses, I've just come out with the jewelry case course, which I'll show you here. Okay, I've got some rings in there just to demonstrate what it kind of looks like. So that's the latest course release. And this one is really teaching you some new skills. A lot of them I've been waiting a long time to teach as well. Um, from the days where I used to restore vintage leather goods. One of the, my favorite things was to restore was uh, vintage jewelry cases. I don't know why, I just find them so fascinating with their little ring cushions and partitions and drawers and all little fancy stuff that you just don't see anymore. So uh, this has been a really fun course and I hope a lot of you really enjoy it and get some techniques that you can use in uh, other areas of your leather craft as well. So thank you for joining me and I will see you again very, very soon. Thanks for watching guys.